Hello, and welcome to another webcast brought to you by Digital Dimensions, Ford Engineering Solutions. And today, we're going to discover what's new with Solders 2012 in regard to sketching, parts, and features. I'll be your host, Joseph Richter. And for discovering what's new with Solders 2012, we're going to start off by talking about some sketching enhancements. First up is going to be the anti-aliasing display. This improves the display of the screen so that way your dimensions and text will be more clear, which is particularly useful if you give presentations in SolidWorks and you use the Windows 7 zoom. That would be the Windows flag key and the plus sign, which will essentially zoom in your entire screen to help show somebody some detail on a drawing or a part. Also with regard to sketching, they've added the normal two option for all new sketches. Now in Solders 2011 and prior, every time you started a new part, the very first sketch would view normal two for you on the first sketch only. Well now in Solders 2012, they've added the ability to turn on this option so that every new sketch that you create in any single part, the system will automatically view normal two for you. They've added some dimension icons to the right-click menu, so for those of you that use the right-click menu extensively, they've actually expanded the right-click menu by adding all of the sketch entities to the right-click menu. If you've noticed, in 2011, they only had some of the popular sketch tools. Well, now every single sketch tool is in there, which probably means that most of you will need to modify your right-click menu to eliminate the items you do not use. But the good news is, the items that you use that weren't available there are actually there now. They've enhanced diameter dimension creation in the fact that normally if you want a double dimension or a diameter dimension for like a revolve part, you need to dimension the edge and then the center line and then pull past the center line to get the diameter dimension. Well now, after you create one dimension like that, every follow-up dimension will assume that's what you're wanting so when you click on the next line it picks up on the center line for you and gives you that diameter dimension until you click something that would not obviously be a diameter dimension so then it'll escape that mode for you but that is going to help with diameter dimension creation they've improved the escape key and what we're talking about on this is if you go to dimension something and you picked an incorrect entity if you hit escape as you'll remember it usually escaped the whole dimension command so you'd have to say oh yeah let me go click on dimension again then repick my first selection then grab my second selection well now if you pick your first selection and then pick an incorrect second selection by hitting escape it undoes only the second selection that you did and then you go ahead and proceed with the correct selection to create your dimension so that's going to come in handy. And finally, for sketching, anytime you selected a sketch plane for your whole wizard in SolidWorks 2011 and prior, SolidWorks would drop in the default or the first point, which resulted in your first hole location, where you selected that surface or that plane. Well, now in 2012, it will go ahead and select your sketch plane, as always before, but it does not actually drop that first whole location point, thus enabling you to intelligently select on an edge to add concentricity or some other intelligent means of locating that first point. Some enhancements for SolidWorks in 2012 with regard to part display are as follows. They've changed how zebra stripes function. It used to be with zebra stripes it would place your part in the middle of a cube room with stripes on the walls or they would allow you to place your part into a spherical room kind of like in the middle of a ball and the stripes would again be on the surface of the ball well when you do that you're gonna find singularities at the poles of the sphere or in each corner of the cube well now in 2012 these zebra stripes are gonna be horizontal or vertical depending on what you choose or they've even added the ability to select an image they've improved section view in the fact that anytime we're creating a section view in a part model it's always given us a color to show us the faces that we were cutting but the minute we hit OK those colors would go away thus you'd lose some of the clarity that came from creating that section view well now in 2012 they've offered the ability to keep that section cap color 
And finally, with regard to part display, they have now moved ambient occlusion from the back end of the program to the view settings dropdown. For SOLIDWORKS part feature enhancements, they've added a new add-in called part reviewer. Part reviewer basically steps through your model using the rollback bar and presents any of the comments that have been added to that feature on the right hand side, kind of like a presentation. They did a major overhaul on the equations dialog box, a welcome change I think. They've made equations much easier to create so in any given dimension you can just hit equal and then start typing in your equation plus they've allowed equations to be managed much easier by giving you three different view modes they've added the ability to explode multi-body parts this is going to be incredibly useful for those of you that are using weldments and you want an exploded view of your weldment while in the past we've been able to use move copy body command to do this to kind of fake it in there. Now we have native explode view functions just like our assemblies except in the multi-body part environment. And finally my favorite enhancement, the feature freeze. This is for those of you who are making large complex parts dealing in a lot of complex surfaces, maybe some thickens, some boolean operations, features that are very heavy and take quite a while to rebuild. Sometimes parts can take upwards of 10 or 20 minutes to rebuild. Well, feature freeze kind of works in the reverse of rollback. In the past, when you had a part that took forever to rebuild, we would often say, well, roll back to the beginning of the model, make your changes, and then pay the time penalty once. And, and that worked great to a point until you realize, well, all my changes actually need to happen at the end of the tree because I'm trying to add fillets that need to fillet these lofted surfaces that come together and I can't roll back, if you will, to the beginning of the tree to add these features because the geometry is just not there yet for me to fill it. So no amount of rolling back is actually going to improve your performance. Thus, I'm stuck with having to wait on SOLIDWORKS to rebuild or saving the part out as a parasol, bringing it back in and making changes, and then you lost your history altogether. Well, now with the rollback bar, and the freeze bar will be able to isolate the area of the tree that we want to modify so the freeze bar works in the direct opposite of the rollback bar you just grab the freeze bar from the top of the tree and you drag it down and it essentially locks all the features above the freeze bar from rebuilding thus enabling you to speed up your model because now you don't have to pay that 10 minute penalty price even if you're adding features at the bottom of your tree all you need to do is rebuild the features that haven't been frozen. So I think this is going to speed up a lot of complex models, and I'm excited to see that it finally made a commercial release of SOLIDWORKS. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. First up on sketching enhancements, the display of lines, arrows, text, and numbers are now anti-aliased. So on the left, you can see SOLIDWORKS 2011 graphics, and on the right, you can see SOLIDWORKS 2012 graphics. Now from this image you can see how much more clear 2012 is going to be and basically SOLIDWORKS is adding in some gray dots on the text so it's much more smooth when you're looking at the two images. In fact if you look at the description from Wikipedia it describes anti-aliased as being in computer graphics anti-aliasing improves the appearance of polygon edges so they are not jagged but smoothed out on the screen. So I'm going to go ahead and show you SOLIDWORKS 2011 and 2012 side by side zooming in with the Windows 7 zoom function that way we can describe exactly what's happening here but you can see that the 2012 graphics look much much better. So over to SOLIDWORKS we go. Okay so over here in SOLIDWORKS as you take a look at the what's new guide it has this image it shows, okay, here's SOLIDWORKS 2011 versus SOLIDWORKS 2012. This is rasterized, so it doesn't look a whole lot better. Even with my own attempt at recreating the image, you can kind of see the 2011 graphic versus the 2012 graphic. And you can see that the 2012 does look better, but doesn't really explain what's going on. And even when I go into here, into my sketch, and I show a raster to vector comparison, it's still not a fair comparison. 
So what I'd like to do is show these side by side. Okay, and when I go to compare this, I'll close that and close that. And by the way, I have 2011 open here. You can see help about SolidWorks. You see there's 2011, Service Pack 5, and then of course over here I've got 2012, Service Pack 1. All right, so these are both going to be vector graphics. When you hit the Windows 5 key and plus sign on the keyboard, it allows you to zoom in. Okay, so here's 2011 when you're zoomed in, and here's 2012. Okay, you can see that the 2012 actually has some gray squares around all the lettering. Okay, this is the same font in both systems. Okay, because I was able to make the file in 2011 and then open it in 2012. All right, and even when you look at the arrowhead versus the arrowhead here. Okay, so it's not just going to be black squares. They've actually blended in some gray and off-colored squares to make this look a lot more smooth. So for that reason, I think 2012 is going to look much sharper, especially when you're giving presentations. And you happen to zoom in like I'm doing here, okay, which is incredibly useful for class. I, again, use the Windows flag and the plus and minus to zoom in and out to show people things. Well, now this is going to be much more clear. And with that, let's get back to the slideshow. More sketching enhancements. In SOLIDWORKS 2012, they've now added the option of view normal to for all new sketches. Now, keep in mind, in order to use this, you need to go into Tools, Options, and under Sketch, where I've highlighted here on this screen capture, you need to check Auto Rotate View Normal to Sketch Plane on Sketch Creation. So, in SOLIDWORKS 2011 and prior, for every new part, when you created your first sketch, SOLIDWORKS would automatically view normal to on that first sketch and that was handy but as you know most parts have more than one sketch so the second sketch and onward we always had to hit the space bar view normal to or use the view drop down normal to or hit control A in order to view normal to but now we can just set this checkbox in every single sketch that we create it'll rotate normal to for us. And for those of you that are fans of the right-click shortcuts, they've added some additional items for dimensioning. One of the dimensioning shortcuts is when you're drawing a line. We've always had the option to request sketch numeric input. Well, now when we're drawing a line, we can right-click, select sketch numeric input, which then allows you to, while you're drawing the line, type in a value for that line, and then it'll create the line at that size. Now, if you're using sketch numeric input, then perhaps you'll want add dimensions turned on as well, which means when I'm drawing that line, I can type in that 10 dimension, and then it will draw the line at 10 with a dimension at 10, showing me how large the line is. Or if we have a sketch that's not yet fully defined, we now have the option to add a dimension as a driven dimension or a reference dimension. Now, before, I could add a dimension, and then once I was done, I could right-click on it and uncheck driving or set it to make driven. Well, now I can do that while I'm creating the dimension. So this might save you some time as well. Just to mention a little bit more about the right-click menu, all of the sketch icons, all of our sketch tools are now available in the right-click menu. So I think the one thing you guys will notice about this, if you do use the right-click menu, is you're going to want to customize that menu to eliminate a lot of the sketch tools you don't normally use because that right-click menu now is going to be extremely long. But the good news on that is if you wanted a tool that was never there from the right-click menu, well, it will be there now. So the only cost of doing business here is you need to uncheck the items that you don't want to use. But in the end, I think it's going to save you time. And for those of you doing a lot of turned parts, when you're creating a diameter dimension, that is you're clicking on a center line and then a vertex or an edge, as you pull past the center line, it automatically recognizes that you want a double or a diameter dimension. Well, now the very next selection that you make, SOLIDWORKS is going to assume that you want a diameter dimension. So it's going to automatically pick the center line for you, thus allowing you to zoom in and grab each 
additional item that you need a diameter on, which also comes in handy for mirrored parts. The next enhancement here is in regard to escape. Now, in the past, Solders 2011 and prior, when you would dimension something, you make your first selection. If you click on your second selection and it's the wrong selection, we would typically hit escape, which, of course, would exit the dimension command altogether, then you'd have to go back up to hit the dimension command, then make your selections again. Well now, in SOLIDWORKS 2012, when you hit escape, it only undoes your last click, thus enabling you to continue on with your dimensioning. And finally, for the whole wizard, when you select your sketch plane, whether it's before or after you enable the tool, SOLIDWORKS will no longer place the very first point for your first hole. Therefore, when you go to the Positions tab, you click on your sketch plane. You'll notice that around your cursor is the first point and is previewing the hole, but it has not located it yet. So now you can hover on an edge to create your hole concentric to another edge, like a circular boss, for example. And with that, let's go into Solders to take a look at some of this. And we'll open our next file here. When I create a new sketch in 2011 and prior, after the first one, you'll notice SOLIDWORKS does not rotate my view normal to unless I hit the space bar and go to normal to or use the drop down for normal to or control 8. Now, in 2012, if I go into tools options under sketch, I can now specify auto rotate view normal to sketch plane on sketch creation. Now what that does for me when I create a new sketch, SOLIDWORKS automatically rotates it for me. And as I made mention earlier, when you right click, you'll notice that the right click menu has all of our sketch entities. Okay, so I think what most of us are going to be doing is hitting customize menu and unchecking a lot of these that you don't normally use in order to reduce the size of that right click menu. Okay, but if you ever needed any of these items before, they were not available. All right, you had to access the sketch toolbar up top. Well, now you can obviously have much more sketch entities available from the right click menu. The other thing to mention here, if you have a part like this, that could be mirrored right to left. Then when you set up your first sketch, and by the way, that normal two only works on newly created sketches, so maybe 2013 will add in the always view normal two anytime you enter a sketch. But anyway, for this here, if I wanted to fully define this sketch, I could go to my smart dimension, I grab the center line, and then maybe zoom in, grab that vertex there and as long as I pull past that gives me a double dimension okay and now if you look at my cursor let me zoom in there it now shows the center line there so that center line shows me that I'm in diameter dimension mode or double dimension mode so I can actually zoom into my next point okay and even though I'm nowhere near the center line if I zoom out, you'll notice that that is actually a diameter dimension or a double dimension in this case. So I click to drop that one, and then I do that again. So SOLIDWORKS is able to now add double dimensions or diameter dimensions on the fly. And let me enter into another new sketch. The other things that we made mention where while you're sketching, if you right click, we now have sketch numeric input right on the toolbar. So what this means is I can start drawing my line and there you can see the dimension. If I type in five and hit enter, it creates my line at five millimeters. Now, if I wanted that dimension to stay, I could right click and say add dimension. So while I create this next line here, if I type in five, it will create the line at 5 and it will add the dimension for me. The other option was add a driven dimension. Okay, so I could type in 5 and now I have a driven dimension. So I no longer have to click on the dimension and then go to make it driven from other. 
or right click on it and specify driven from there and with that let's get into the very next file here's a complex sketch that I don't actually recommend by the way that you do sketches like this it's just going to complicate your part as you go to make changes but let's say somebody does hand this to you okay again that diameter dimension so that's initially what this file was for was to show the diameter dimension okay after I've added my first one I'm in that mode I then go around and click my next dimensions unless you click off which I missed there so you can see that it does require that you go to click your very next object so there and then etc okay unless like I said you accidentally click in the background like I had done there and then if I pick a wrong item and that last item was not what I wanted to pick if you hit escape you can then proceed to your next selection so escape no longer cancels the entire command it just undoes the last pick so as I hit escape each time I'm able to move where I'm trying to dimension to okay and finally for whole wizard when we go to drop in a whole wizard feature as you go to positions and you select which face where you want to place the hole well I'm going to pick obviously away from the center here okay now when I move my cursor you'll notice that it located the sketch plane but it didn't actually drop the first point so here I'm able to hover on an arc wake up the center and go to place my first hole so by doing this I can now intelligently place every single hole wizard hole I don't have to hit escape and delete my first point or locate my first point then go back and select the point tool to create my others or maybe I place the first one I knew it was off but I placed the other three I hit escape then locate the first one now you can just do it on the fly and with that let's get back to the slides moving on to part display enhancements well in SOLIDWORKS 2012 zebra stripes have changed the way that they function in the zebra stripe property manager you now have these two options you can orient your zebra stripes horizontally or vertically or additionally you can use an image instead of zebra stripes by choosing what picture to show in the environment list and here's a quick page out of the what's new guide trying to show the differences between the zebra stripes aside from the zebra stripes they've changed how section view now works section view now allows you to keep the cap color for part clarity okay particularly if you're sectioning a multi-body part this will enable you to see which face is actually being cut and from which direction with that let's get into SOLIDWORKS to see this okay so first up zebra stripe display okay in here I have yet another image to describe SOLIDWORKS 2011 you can see if we chose a spherical map it would put you like in the middle of a ball or a cube map would put you in the middle of a square room alright and here I have my sphere and when I turn on my zebra stripes so view display zebra stripes I have the option for vertical stripes or horizontal stripes okay now the difference here is I will not get any singularities now to kind of show this live I have 2011 up and to show the zebra stripes in 2011 here I can see the cube map and when I rotate the model around you can see the singularities in the corners okay and then when I go to the spherical map you can see that that's the singularity right there in the middle okay so depending on how I'm looking at this I might get confusing results
Again, you go to Zebra Stripe Properties. If I go to the cube map, same idea. I get my singularity moving around. So I may not get the mapping that I like. Now in 2012, by the way, this is 2011, right? Help about solders, so there's 2011. But here in 2012, when I go to the Zebra Stripe Properties, I can see horizontal or vertical stripes and I'm going to get much more reliable feedback. Okay, so I won't get any singularities due to the image map. Now, the other option that they've given us in 2012 is the ability to specify an image. So if I use the drop down for environment, I can specify from file and I can browse for a picture. So now I get an image to see reflected off of my part. Now, what this is all trying to do is show you if there's tangency on a surface. So for example, if I dropped a whole wizard on this part, okay, and I located it right there, once I turn on my zebra stripes, Okay, I can see that that image is interrupted, or if I was doing those stripes, again, you can see that those stripes are interrupted and do not continue down into the hole. Now, if on the other hand I had a fillet on that edge, then you'll notice that the stripe continues from surface to surface, showing me that I have tangency in my model. Okay, so zebra stripes is an analysis tool to help us see what's going on with that surface. Now in SOLIDWORKS 2011, and this is also how I will tie it into real view, we had the option to use real view, and we still do in 2012, but in real view, if I were to apply a reflective surface like chrome stainless steel, Okay, you have an environment map being reflected off of the surface here. So all Zebra Stripes did was kind of mimic real view functionality to see the image of the environment. And in fact, that's one of the things that I go over in class is aside from Zebra Stripes, if you want to see what it, the part might look like aesthetically, you can bounce an image off of it using real view. Uh, so it's nice to see that they've gone ahead and just done that in the Zebra Stripe properties for 2012. So again, that's just in Solders 2012. You can right click, go to Zebra Stripe properties, and then choose an image from a file. And with that, let's look at our next file. Okay, on this multi-body part, if I go to add a section, if I just hit OK, then I can see that I've made my section. But with most of this part being gray, it may be confusing as to which face uh, that I added that section to. OK, but if I go to add the section color, keep cap color, then it highlights the faces so I can see which faces were cut during my section view. And with that, let's get back to the slideshow. Next up on part display enhancements is ambient occlusion. Now, ambient occlusion is available from the view settings dropdown. When we talk about graphics in SOLIDWORKS, we mention things like real view. Well, real view graphics, what that does is it actually mimics what a reflective surface looks like. Now, in photography, if you ever tried taking a picture of a chromed part, like a knife or a gun, you'll notice that it's very difficult to get a high quality or good looking picture of that shiny object because you're literally taking a picture of a mirror. So the photography trick is to give that surface something to look at, thus enhancing the details on that surface. Well, when we're talking about ambient occlusion, we're kind of coming from the other spectrum. After all, ambient occlusion is going to enhance the shadows on non-reflective surfaces. 
which means that your parts are going to look better if they're not shiny and you turn on ambient occlusion. So if you're adding a bunch of lights to your model, then this will actually diminish the ambient occlusion effect on your models. So we have real view for the shiny parts and ambient occlusion to enhance the shadows on those parts, but it shows much more dramatically on non-reflective or not shiny parts. And with that, let's go into SOLIDWORKS to take a look at this. Okay, so over here in SOLIDWORKS, if I turn on real view, in this particular part here, I have made it so it's not reflective. Okay, you can see I have some texturing on here. And when I turn on ambient occlusion, you can see how it adds shadows or shading to those surfaces. Particularly when I zoom in, you can see how it's added that extra shadow effect. Now you'll notice that it does pause okay, while I'm rotating and then once I stop rotating then it adds the ambient occlusion look. Now even though I've done my best to try to eliminate the reflection on this part, I'm still using some reflection. Okay, so this actually does show a little bit better on another file that I have here. This part here. Okay, so without ambient occlusion it looks like this and I'm just rotating it to kind of show you. And then when I let go, it adds that ambient occlusion to it. So ambient occlusion is going to enhance the shadows on your part. And with that, let's get back to the slideshow. And on to SOLIDWORKS 2012 feature enhancements. For our first feature enhancement, SOLIDWORKS has added the part reviewer. And although what the part reviewer does is not necessarily new functionality, what this allows us to do when we add it in from tools add-ins is when we click on play to review the part, it will basically take the rollback bar and go all the way to the top of the tree and then roll through the tree like a slideshow. Now the added benefit of this is if you've gone in and you've added a comment, that's when you right click on a feature and go to comments, add comment, part reviewer will show those comments over here on the right hand side as you look at each feature of that part. Now this is going to become an invaluable training tool. In fact SOLIDWORKS has posted some files up on their blog site to talk about best practices. And in fact, our own Maurice from Tech Support has worked on some of these models to show best practices. So to check out the forum, if you'd go to this link here, and I'll go ahead and bring that up. From here, you'll be able to click on this link to see some files. And each file has a description, and you'll be able to use the part reviewer to take a look and see some best practices. And with that, let's go over to SOLIDWORKS so I can show you how this works. Okay, over here in SOLIDWORKS, to turn on the part reviewer, you go to add-ins, and then specify SOLIDWORKS part reviewer. From there, it opens up the task pane, and you can simply hit play on the part reviewer. Now this is going to roll back the model and step through each feature. Now you'll notice that it says here no comment available for this feature. And by the way I hit pause there which means I can also step back or step forward. Okay now in order to add a comment to a feature you just right click on the feature, go to comment, add comment, and here's where you leave clues behind for how this feature needs to be modified. At any time you can do a date and time stamp and you can say feature comment, whatever you need somebody else to know before modifying. And normally the way we look at comments is when you hover your cursor on that feature, it gives you the comment in a balloon. Well here in part reviewer, as I go back over that feature, I'll be able to see the comment that's been applied to it. Okay, so this allows me to play through the model and read the comments 
like I said, kind of like a presentation style look at the history tree. Now, I do have a part that's been more heavily commented than this one, so let me go ahead and open that one. And then I can go ahead and over to the part viewer and hit play. And here you can see each feature with the comment that's been applied to it. So again, this is why I'm calling this a valuable training tool. If you have specific parts that need to be modeled in a specific manner, then you can go ahead and create a generic data set and comment it heavily like this as SOLIDWORKS is showing best practices and describe to perhaps new employees why you build the models in the manner that you do, you know, whether it's manufacturing reasons or what have you. This is a great tool to educate anybody else who might take these models and either learn from them or need to create models similar to them. So again, that's SOLIDWORKS Part Reviewer. And this one's almost finished up here. Like I said, at any time, if you didn't want to wait, of course, you could hit pause and then step it through manually, which also means that you can go back and find out or read one of the comments specifically. All right. And with that, let's get back to the slideshow. For the next feature enhancement, equations. Equations have gotten a major facelift in SOLIDWORKS 2012. And just for starters, they have given us three different ways to look at our equations. We have the equation view, the dimension view, or the ordered view. The order view will basically automatically determine the order that your equations need to be solved with one rebuild. The dimension view allows you to see all of your dimensions in your model, as well as all of your global variables. And the equation view shows you all of your equations. And if that's still not enough, we also have a filter that allows you to filter through all your equations. And they've also added a new measure option. So if you're writing an equation and you find out you need a dimension variable that you have not yet gone in there to add, you can go ahead while you're making the equation and specify measure and then pick the measurement of the variable that you need in your equation. And with that, let me take you over to SOLIDWORKS to show you how this works. And back over here in SOLIDWORKS, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my part reviewer because I'm done with it. And I'm going to go ahead and open the next file that I've created to share equations with you. And one of the first things to point out here about SOLIDWORKS 2012 is the Modify dialog box. As I double click on a dimension, you'll notice that the Modify now it gives me the opportunity to rename the dimension right in the dialog box. So here I can go ahead and call this dimension width. Okay, no longer do I have to click on my dimension and go over here to the primary values to rename it. I can rename it right on the fly. Now, one of the things that's changed is how we write an equation. It used to be we would find the child variable, double click on it, and then we would hit the drop down to add equation. Well here, if I hover my cursor over the modify dialog, you'll notice that SOLIDWORKS says start with an equal sign to create an equation. So I could say that this dimension is going to be equal to maybe my width minus, let's say two times my diameter. Okay, and once I've written my equation, if you hover your cursor there, it tells you what the result is. Now if you'd mistype something, then SOLIDWORKS is going to turn that item that is not valid red. So there's some built-in intelligence there to kind of help you write your equations. And then of course when you hit rebuild, it updates the location of that boss for me. And then to test that equation, I could double click on that dimension modify it, hit rebuild, and I see that it responds. To do that for the other direction, I'll find the child variable, tell SOLIDWORKS that's going to be equal to the height minus two times 
my boss diameter. Again, I rebuild and I watch it update. And then I can test it. Now, one of the other changes that has happened here is in regard to link values. Now, in SOLIDWORKS 2011 and prior, we could always right click on a variable and specify link values. Well, currently, it looks like that's the way that we're going to have to generate link values in 2012. All right, because when you double click, there's nothing here for link values. There's global variables, but that's going to add an equation that says this dimension is equal to that. So you're going to have the parent-child problem in some scenarios. In this case here, I'm just going to right-click link value, and then of course use the drop-down here for offset. And then I can see it update that way. Now to show how the dialog looks, if I right-click on the equations folder, I can manage equations. And here are the three views. Here's the equation view. This shows meld equations that have been applied to this model. If I go to the dimension view, it's going to show me all the dimensions in the model, as well as our global variables or our link dimensions. Or we can take a look at the ordered view. Now the ordered view allows me to ask SOLIDWORKS to automatically place the dimensions and the equations in the order that they need to be solved with one rebuild. And if these three views aren't enough to help you find the equation you're looking for, you can go ahead and type in the variable you're looking for. As I start typing in height, that finds my height there. And with that, let's get back to the slideshow. And the next feature enhancement for SOLIDWORKS 2012 is in regard to multi-body parts. And for those of you working on complex weldments, we now have the ability to, as a native feature, create a multi-body part explode. And the good news is, is that this functions just like an assembly explode. And for those of you who are using the master part modeling technique, that would be another way of approaching in-context assembly design, wherein you take a fairly complex part that will wind up becoming in the manufacturing process multiple pieces, okay, kind of like this knife here, one of the ways to handle this is to build your complex geometry all in a single part file and then take the individual bodies and save them out as individual parts, creating an assembly later on. And one of the enhancements relative to saving these bodies out is to basically specify what template these parts will be saved out with. And with that, let's get over to SOLIDWORKS to show this. All right, so to take a look at the exploded weldman, if you watched my weldman's tips and tricks webcast, then you'll notice that back in 2009, I was showing how to create an exploded weldman, wherein I was talking about insert features, move copy bodies. And that was sort of a tip uh, in order to take each one of these structural members and then simply move them. Okay, but the problem is, is I had to do that for every single structural member, as you see here. And it also required that I created a separate configuration in order to do that. All right, so it didn't have built-in functionality like an assembly. Well, now, as I go back to my default config, I would point out that we can now right click and add a new explode view and this interface here you'll recognize from an assembly and it works just the same way that our assembly explode does you know you click on your multiple bodies or structural members in this case and then click on the triad arrow to move the bodies in the direction that you need them to be exploded at and then you proceed to click on your next structural member to move out, etc. Okay, it also has auto spacing after drag, just like we do in the assembly. And then once you're done exploding it, it explodes and collapse just like an assembly. You right click on the explode view to collapse or explode. 
Okay, so it's excellent to see this functionality make it to multi-body parts. And the next file that I have to share with you is this part file here. Now this part file is actually a knife designed by Gil Hibben. It's a one-handed bat left that he designed for a Star Trek movie. It was never actually used, but it's still a very cool looking part. And what I did here with this particular model is I designed the handle, or rather I modeled the handle right with the blade. And again, it's another master modeling technique. The ability to build an assembly at the part level, but eventually you're going to want to save these out into their own part files and create an assembly from it. So in order to do this, we can right click on the solid bodies folder and save bodies. Now, what's new with SOLIDWORKS 2012 at the bottom here is the ability to override the default template settings. Now, the default templates, again, that's super important. The default templates are set under Tools Options for default templates. These are the default templates that SOLIDWORKS will use when you import a file, whether it's a parasolid or a step. These are the ones that it uses by default. Now these templates are established the first time that you install SOLIDWORKS and it asks you what dimensioning standard to use and what units that you want to use. Even if you weren't paying attention to those questions, those questions made these templates. So what I'm saying to you is that you should have these pointed at your company templates if they're not already. So what this enhancement for 2012 does, when I go to save these bodies out, is it gives me the opportunity to point at a different template. So if you've already got your default templates under control, then this enhancement is no big deal, but uh, maybe for those of you that haven't seen this yet, this is pretty exciting because then it'll give you the option to point at the desired company part template to use for all these bodies that you save off into their own part files. And with that, let's get back to the slideshow. Finally, my favorite enhancement to SOLIDWORKS 2012 is the feature freeze. Now, for some of you that have been playing with beta the last couple of releases, you'll notice that there's been this feature freeze, albeit by another name, that was in beta that never made the final cut. It's nice to see that feature freeze finally made it to the commercial product because I think this is going to be a huge time saver for those of you that create complex parts. Now, the way that you use this feature freeze is you actually need to turn it on under tools options for general. You need to enable the freeze bar. Now, on the feature statistics that I have shown here, you can see that I have a part that takes 1909 seconds to rebuild. Now, if you whip out your calculator and divide by 60, you'll notice that that's around a 32 minute rebuild time. That's a long time to be waiting, so that means any time that I'm modifying that part, if I try to make a change and I hit control Q, I get to twiddle my thumbs for 32 minutes. Okay, that makes this a very difficult prospect of making changes quick and easy. So what feature freeze allows me to do is freeze most of the features and save some time. So after I froze some features on that same part file, I brought my rebuild time down to 182 seconds. Okay, and so that's right around three minutes. Far faster than the full loaded part file. Again, the times that you would use this would be on super complex parts and you need to make changes on those complex parts towards the bottom of the tree. Common thing to add at the bottom of a tree would be your fillets. The old advice was to roll back to the beginning of your tree, make all your changes, and then roll to the end paying the rebuild penalty only once but obviously if your changes need to happen to features that are later on in the tree well then you're gonna have to pay the rebuild penalty up the tree well here this will chop the rebuild time down from the top now one thing to point out about feature freeze is it will not reduce all the rebuild time for everything for example it's still gonna have to update the graphics of the model so you're gonna have to play with this on your own files but I'm excited the fact that it will get rid of a lot of rebuild time 
with regard to the math that SOLIDWORKS has to do. And with that, let's get back over to SOLIDWORKS to share how this works. And back over here in SOLIDWORKS, in order to see how long it takes a part to rebuild, you just go to the Tools drop-down under Feature Statistics. And here I can see that this part takes about 3.36 seconds to rebuild. So not a whole lot of my time is wasted on the computer. Now, if I go to open another file, and in keeping with this Star Trek theme, I have a part that takes much longer than three seconds to rebuild, as well as a few minutes to open. But we have the magic of editing, so you don't have to wait as long. And once I finally get this part open, if I want to see how long it takes it to rebuild, I right click, I can go to recent commands and check out the statistics. And here's our 32 minute rebuild time. Now, in order to speed this model up, I need to enable the freeze bar. To do that, you go into tools options under general and you'll find enable freeze bar. Once it's turned on, you'll notice that it gives you this gold bar at the top of the tree. This is the freeze bar. Now, it works just like the rollback bar and the fact that you can drag it down the tree. Rollback bar, you would obviously drag up the tree, but the freeze bar we drag down the tree. And when we do that, it adds locks to the features that it will not rebuild. Now, if I go to statistics again, I can see how long it takes to rebuild now. Okay, so you can see that I've frozen a couple hundred seconds. And then as I go down the tree some more, I can freeze more time. So let me look at statistics. We were at 1909, now we're down to 1735. Last time we were at 1780. Okay, so there's 139 features that are not being updated due to freeze. So those 139 features saved me about 150 seconds thereabouts. But a majority of the time is actually in this thickened folder. So let me go ahead and roll the freeze bar below thicken. Okay, and now all these features are no longer going to be updated. And when I take a look at my statistics, I'm down to 620 seconds. All right, and basically you can use this freeze bar to limit the amount of time it takes the model to rebuild. Because now, statistics, I'm down to 182 seconds, or roughly three minutes. So saving me about a half hour every time I make a change. Now the cost is I need to make my changes at this point in the tree, but if I needed to add a fillet or something that had to happen after the tree, and I needed to hit Control Q to watch everything update, well this is limiting what's gonna get updated. So Control Q right now will take 182 seconds for it to rebuild. So again, for those of you that are creating complex parts, this feature freeze is going to speed up your workday because you can use it in combination with the rollback bar. After all, the rollback bar was the old way to save time. You'd roll back to the beginning of the tree to make your changes and pay the time penalty once. Well, now we can straddle from the top and the bottom the portion of the tree that needs to be modified and then obviously roll to the end to pay the time penalty for the end of the tree and then if you really need all of your parent features to update you could obviously use the freeze bar in the reverse and thaw everything up the tree. So again huge huge time saver for those of you building complex parts. And with that let's get back to the slideshow to close this out. Keep in mind that we here in the DDI Tech Center are constantly trying to reach out to you. You can find us on the following social forums. You can follow us on Twitter. You can check out our Facebook page. You can view our tech tips on YouTube. You can listen to our weekly podcast at SolidWorksHerd.com or from the iTunes store. You can search SolidWorks and you'll find SolidWorks Herd. Or you can check out our microblog at Herd.SolidWorksHerd.com. Thank you for joining me on another What's New webcast. I'm your host, Joseph Richter, and I hope this will help you get the most out of the newest release of SOLIDWORKS.